Thanks a lot. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be <coughs> with you here tonight. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words uh, to explain this new label that you see on the top of the, the signs, i.e. Pivotal. Uh, who are we? Uh, why are we here? And why are we now the custodians uh, for the Spring family? I was at uh, VMware back in 2009 uh, when we acquired SpringSource. Uh, and that move was motivated by the belief that at the end of the day, almost everything in the IT industry is driven by applications. Uh, business value is encoded by applications, and infrastructure really is a means to just running those applications. And consequently, if you want to be successful uh, in the IT industry, it's important to have a very close connection and understanding of what is happening in the application development space, uh, how developers are thinking, and how they're going to use software to generate, to enable enterprises and businesses to generate new business value. And that was the motivation uh, behind that uh, marriage that occurred back in 2009. And then going forward, uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, a group of us started to think very carefully about what was happening in the industry and came to the conclusion uh, that we were seeing the transition from one generation to the other. Uh, I'm just old enough to have started my uh, working career as a programmer working on mainframes in the late 1970s uh, and then spent most of my working career in the 80s and 90s uh, working on the client server generation and saw that whole change uh, sweep through the industry. And we believe that a similar change is about to move through our industry as the underlying architectures change. I, I'm also, as a software guy, humbled enough to know that fundamental change in, in software really occurs when some fundamental change uh, happens in the hardware, when something becomes, from a constraint to a resource point of view, no longer a constraint. <laughs> uh, client server generation, in some senses, was enabled by CPU cycles, at least by historical standards, mainframe standards becoming free. Uh, so all of a sudden we could afford to throw CPU cycles at such trivial things as a graphical user interface or more profoundly a relational database, etc. <laughs> uh, and uh, we believe that we're on the threshold of a similar transition, that uh, things are fundamentally changing in the lower layers and giving us a new set of resources to work with. Uh, and that we believe this change goes under the la label of infrastructure level clouds and infrastructure level clouds are la OpenStack or vSphere or, or Amazon AWS or, or, or Azure are becoming the new hardware that over the next several years they will become the new core hardware that we can assume that we have to work with. And when that happens, things are going to become free. The ability to have a large number of machines as a developer to work with is going to become free. You're going to be able to ask for not just one or two, but 10 or 20 or 100 or even 1,000 machines if you want to work with them, and the cloud will manufacture them for you and give them to you. And storage is, by similar historical standards, going to become free. And we think that these two quantities are going to be becoming free are going to have a profound impact on what can be done, and you can already see uh, the pioneers in the consumer internet space have already done that. They've used those two concepts to remake the way they process information and find ways to deal with information much more cost effectively, bigger scale, etc. So when we looked at this and said there's a new shift coming, uh, we believed that it was important to get ourselves organized and get real focus on it uh, and say if this the cloud is becoming the new hardware, so as to speak. What should we do about it? And uh, what we decided to do was really pull together three sets of resources, starting, first of all, with understanding of where applications are and how they're being built. And for that reason, the first resource we pulled in was the, the spring set of assets, uh, because we believe that the spring assets are still the most relevant uh, space where enterprise computing is happening today. So understanding how we can uh, extend that set of capabilities to take advantage of the cloud and the new kinds of things that clouds are going to do, we think is going to be incredibly important going forward. 
But we also, in addition to the Spring family of assets, uh, brought into this new company uh, another uh, asset called Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry uh, is the subject of a conference that is going on here uh, over the last two days, and its function really is to be the new operating system, so as to speak. If you think of clouds as the new hardware, you might ask yourself, what's the new operating system? What will give you uh, abstraction uh, and automation across different underlying clouds? Because we want the cloud, if it's becoming the new hardware, not to be the new highly proprietary mainframe. <laughs> We want it to be something that developers can freely use. And there's a lot of work going on if you extend uh, some of the sessions at the Cloud Foundry conference about making sure that Cloud Foundry is a great recipient for spring programs. So that if you're writing in spring, it'll be very easy to deploy and, and use the resources of the cloud uh, through, through uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, and then the third set of assets that we brought in uh, were new data fabric assets because we believe that the data fabrics are going to undergo profound change. We've seen that the direction pointed there by Hadoop, who are using these new quantities of highly scalable storage and lots of machines to remake how you can think about and use uh, data. We believe that same paradigm will get used over all of the other important data, data access methods, relational query, transaction, event ingest, etc. So we brought in teams uh, that have seen that movie before, if you like, who've learned how to work with a large number of machines working in parallel to get new kinds of results. So we brought in application fabric through the Spring family, cloud fabric through Cloud Foundry, data fabric uh, uh, through uh, the Green Plum and Gemfire teams, and we've been working with them to try to pull those into a more of a coherent whole. Uh, will still remain choice, so Spring can be used as a, an open family of software in the same way as it's always been used. We're doing work in Cloud Foundry to make it so that it's easy for a Spring programmer to deploy. That work has been done to match Cloud Foundry to Spring. And finally, as you'll hear uh, from Adrian in just a minute, uh, in addition to all the other innovation that's been going on in Spring to make Spring a better environment for writing programs, uh, a large part of the innovation is about how to access new ways of dealing with data. <laughs> so we hope to continue to be a, a great steward of, spri of, of the Spring family, that includes Groovy and Grails, uh, to really work with you in the development community because we think that greatly enriches our understanding of the kind of infrastructure and support that we need to provide uh, for the applications that uh, you all are developing both today and in the future. So with that, it's, uh, I'd like to say thank you for your attendance. Uh, uh, we deeply appreciate it. And I, I'd next like to introduce our CTO, Adrian Collier, uh, who's going to, who's I'm sure familiar to many of you, and is going to kick off uh, in earnest this evening's program. <laughs> All right, thank you, Paul. Okay, hope you're all ready for this. It's gonna be a good show this year. Um, as ever, it's absolutely wonderful to see so many of you here. Uh, so many familiar faces wandering around the halls, many new faces. I'm really looking forward to kind of just hanging out with you over the next few days, getting to know some of you, hearing what's going on, etc. cetera. Um, I think you've picked a really, really good year to come to Spring 1 2GX. This is gonna be a vintage year, I can feel it coming. Um, it's actually uh, the 10th anniversary of spring this year. Can you believe it? We're having our 10th birthday. Um, we're also at the same time announcing the release of Spring Framework 4.0, and you're gonna hear more about that later on tonight. Um, I was reflecting back over some of the, you know, the previous sort of spring ones that we've put on, and uh, some of you have been to a number of those. Um, some of the fun we've had, we've had quite a lot of fun at spring ones, if you remember. Um, the, uh, the duck typing episode with the puppets. I still, that was actually seven years ago, guys. So I, I still get asked about have the puppets come. We had duck typing with the puppets. We had the Monty Python sketches, you may remember. Uh, the Vikings. I found the, uh, the script for what has spring ever done for us this afternoon. That was good reminiscing. Uh, you may remember the hats, the silly, we did the silly hats. Uh, there was the unfortunate episode with the baggage, if you remember that, in New Orleans, where the, not all of the baggage arrived. Um, 
And tonight's title is uh, I.O. I.O. It's off to work we go. And um, I couldn't help thinking about that. And it kind of reminds me of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs when I think about that title. And it so happens that following me tonight, there are exactly seven spring leads for the, uh, the rest of tonight's keynote and tomorrow night's keynote. Um, very tempting, I have to tell you. And it was easy to figure out who was going to be grumpy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> spring leads know who that is. Um, Dave Slyer, he's flown over from... Um, <laughs> no, Dave isn't grumpy. No, someone else is grumpy. Dave Slyer's flown over from the UK like me, so I guess he could be sleepy. Um, it all ran aground in two places, to be honest with you. We couldn't agree who was going to be dopey. Nobody wanted to be that. Um, and I figured out I'd actually have to be Snow White, and uh, <laughs> the dress wasn't working. So there is no sketch tonight, but we're still going to have a lot of fun. We have got so much good news stuff to show you. Um, it's actually an embarrassment of riches. There is so much that I think my, my first and foremost job here tonight is to give you a map to understand the territory so you've got a context to place in everything that we're doing. Um, and so that's what I want to do just for this first opening 10 minutes, is share with you sort of how we think about the application landscape, the spring landscape, where we're taking it. Um, and of course, spring can be used to power a whole wide variety of workloads these days. If we roll back uh, kind of those 10 years in the beginning, spring was very much about server-side web applications. You remember, you still know and love you know, spring MVC. Um, of course, we've evolved it over the intervening 10 years. Um, we now have really, really good first-class REST support in there. I think it actually beats every other language and framework. If you want to be a really good RESTful API, Spring is the best place to do it, hands down. Um, remember the, the controllers, abstractions, validation, binding, etc. cetera. Um, new this year in Spring Framework 4, you'll hear more about it. We've integrated first-class WebSocket support. You're going to see some demos later on. We're going to be doing some fun stuff. We'll have um, a messaging layer built over the top of WebSocket, because that's a fairly low-level interface, right? Um, we'll have some stomp messaging coming in. We'll process all of that. Um, we'll later show you how to connect that up on the client side as well. So we began in the web arena. And then, of course, you remember, uh, we introduced integration. And integration workloads are really, really important in the enterprise. Um, so much of what we do is gluing information together from different systems. And here, Spring has, as you know, sort of based on the enterprise integration patterns work, a core set of abstractions you know, in channels and adapters and filters and transformers and all those other elements that you see in that world. Um, and we're working hard towards Spring Integration 3.0 at the moment as well. And if integration is all about kind of processing streams of data and messages that comes by, then of course there's also the case of dealing with data in batches or chunks. Um, and we have, of course, you know, batch workloads, really, really another unglamorous when we started it, but really important part of the enterprise. Um, and with the emergence of Hadoop, we're seeing a whole new class of kind of batch processing and workloads arising. We'll say more about that later as well. Um, so Spring Batch, many of you know, gives you a set of common abstractions for thinking about batch workloads, the notions of batch jobs that are divided into a number of steps that have readers and writers for bringing the data in and pushing the data out again. Big news in the batch space, uh, which we started Six years ago, I believe we started the Spring Batch project uh, with our friends from Accenture at the time, um, is that uh, there's been some work in the JSR space. There's JSR 356, many of you know, which is the, the batch application JSR, heavily based on Spring Batch. And we're now, that went final this year. So six years later, we've got a JSR matching kind of our, our model there. Uh, and we are now retrofitting those JSR APIs into the Spring Batch project. You'll hear more about that again tomorrow. And of course, I've got three sort of nice little boxes here, but any one enterprise application typically will mix aspects of all of these different workload styles. There'll be some web, there'll be some integration, there'll be some batch, etc. That's quite common, that's quite normal. That's why the spring modules are delivered so the things you can embed inside your application so you can mix and match as you need. Now, a really good example of you know, emerging workload type that has this kind of mix of the different stuff is actually what we're doing in the big data space. Um, Andy Clement and I, he doesn't know this, but Andy Clement and I um, are particularly fond of the big data space. Um, we feel right at home there. 
The reason is it's the first kind of technology domain after AOP where the first example everybody ever mentions is logging. And so we, we just feel right at home all over again. Um, big data. Um, it's all very well kind of laying down a large Hadoop cluster. But now, how are you going to get the data that's all over your enterprise actually into that cluster? How are you going to ingest it? How are you going to orchestrate the batch workloads that process and analyze that data? How are you going to export the results when you finish so that your business systems can work based on them? Um, and the fundamental insight that we had there is actually that looks awfully like the enterprise integration and batch processing kind of patterns that we've been working in for many years. And so we took a project, Spring Data for Apache Hadoop, and we built on top of Spring Integration, we built on top of Spring Batch, and we put some kind of HTFS and other kind of fun stuff in there. And that is you know, the Spring Data for Apache Hadoop and the beginnings of a you know, big data so application style. And we have more to say about that as we go through. So there are a variety of different workload types. Underpinning all of them, really, when you think about it, is, as we've just been talking about, data. Again, when we started, roll the clock back to 10 years, data really meant relational database. Right? And we went through JDBC, we went through Hibernate, various other RM mappers. We got JPA. We've now got the fantastic Spring Data JPA libraries. Um, but they were all really kind of abstraction, different levels of abstraction over the same fund, uh, un fundamental and underlying model. Now we're seeing, as I'm sure you've noticed uh, recently, a, a wide variety and explosion in what's happening in the data space. We have structured and unstructured data. We have relational and non-relational data. We have data on disk. We have data in memory. Uh, we have normal-sized data, and we have supersized data. We call that big. Um, and the spring data projects have really grown up to encompass that whole mix of modern data challenges, you know, be it um, HDFS, key value, be it document store, um, be it still relational, etc., be it just flat files, whatever. Spring data is there to accommodate your needs. So we have different workload styles that work with a wide range of different ways of dealing with data. And underpinning all of that, there is, um, of course, a core. This is where we find good old sort of Spring Framework 4.0. We're doing something this year that we've only done twice before since the first release of Spring Framework. So Spring Framework 1.0 in our 10-year history, only twice before have we ever updated the major version of Spring. So that's not something we do lightly. Um, one of my fears is with all the news we've got this week, that you, know, you don't all remember just how, how exciting it is to have a Spring Framework 4 at last. There's some really great features in that. Um, later on, you will hear from Mr. Spring himself, Jürgen Hurler, um, about what we've got in there. We've got full support for Java SE8. We've got everything you need to take advantage of the latest sort of improvements in Java EE 7. We've got the WebSocket support I mentioned. There's a whole lot more in there. Um, so the Spring Framework remains at the core of everything we do. Um, security is another concern, really, that every application, regardless of workload type, needs to address. Um, you may remember way back in the ACG days. We've come a long way since then. Um, You'll be pleased to know, some of you won't understand this, it's not that worry, but you'll be pleased to know that I recently had a, a survey done. We went out and found out that actually the fairy population is alive and well and fully recovered these days. Um, ben Alex always used to say every time somebody uses a CG, a fairy dies. <laughs> the, the configuration was a little complex back in the early days. You should check out what we're doing these days. It's so much smoother, so much easier. A uh, good example, Rob Winch has been working on the, the really good CSRF protection support. Also down in this core layer, I've put Groovy down here. Groovy, like Spring, is actually celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. So it's amazing to think of how long these things go back. 10 years of engineering effort gone into that environment. Um, incredibly powerful language, works beautifully with your existing Java classes and libraries, the best integration of any other kind of non-Java language on the Java platform. Um, it's got static you know, typing and compilation when you need it. Um, it's had closure support for like forever. Um, in the latest release, they're working on an even more concise declaration syntax to be sort of just as succinct as Java 8 is now. Um, so if when you see sort of some of the stuff that Jürgen's going to show you, you think, oh, I wish I could do that. I'm not going to be in production on Java 8 like forever. Well, you've got Groovy there. Um, really powerful part of the core of the platform. Also new this year, there's a lot of new stuff this year, a component called Reactor. Uh, John Brisbane and Co have been working on this. 
foundation for asynchronous workloads that underpins many things we're doing in Spring and in Grails. Um, one of the uh, almost unbelievable quotes from John's blog recently, um, one of the things that Reactor has is sort of a um, processing pattern that's based on a particular configuration of the LMAX disruptor ring buffer. Um, in that particular configuration on his MacBook, uh, he claims to get 100 million events per second being processed. Um, I was trying to validate that, but I couldn't count quick enough. But you know, it seems, um, seems pretty impressive to me. So if you take that whole set of things that we've just talked about, then really, um, that represents a foundation on which you can build a wide range of enterprise applications. Um, and that foundational platform we call Spring I.O. So we're introducing this new technology to represent the platform as a whole, the Spring I.O. platform. We know that um, for any one application, we always want to make sure that you only use the parts of Spring that you need. And so you'll be well aware there are many Spring projects that result in a large number of Spring modules. Um, it's important that you only take what you need inside your application. But it also presents a problem of how do I find um, compatible versions, the right set of modules and the compatible versions to pull together to make a known good working set. So one of the things we're going to be doing with the introduction of the Spring IO platform is this notion of a platform release in which we'll actually say, here is a cohesive version set of the modules that we've tested that we know work together. Um, that will address one of the pain points that we've been hearing from you, and it forms a, a basis for standardization inside your enterprise if you're looking for something like that. So we call this part of the world that I've just been describing the Spring I.O. Foundation. Um, and to go with kind of Spring Framework 4 and its beating heart and all the kind of the new stuff that we're driving up, we're also going to unveil later on tonight, and I'm not going to steal too much of the thunder, but we're going to unveil a, a brand new uh, Spring website to go with all of this. It's also been completely overhauled to represent the modern face of Spring. Um, it's got some really, really good task-focused guides. It's got a much easier, more approachable way of understanding Spring. You know, one of the things with being 10 years old and being incredibly popular is that Google has referenced lots and lots and lots of information about Spring, and you'll see some kind of old, very XML-heavy ways of doing things. That's not the modern Spring, and you're going to really see that this week. Um, and the new website work, you'll see it later, really shows that off. Um, so that's the I.O. foundation. Now, on top of the foundation, we've got this layer we call the Spring I.O. execution layer. Um, you've all heard of a DSL, right? So we're introducing a new term, at least I think it's new, uh, the DSR, the Domain Specific Runtime. Um, so in this layer, we have runtimes, particularly to certain domains, um, built on top of DSLs, et cetera, designed to make it much, much easier and more efficient to build certain classes of application. And of course, the first DSR and the guys who really set the way, and it took us a long while to kind of catch up and realize they were onto a good thing, is the Grails team. So Grails, fantastic full stack web framework, makes heavy use of groovy DSLs, the full power of the groovy language, but with everything that's great about Spring under the hood. Marvelous combination. Graham is going to be here. He's going to be on the stage tomorrow evening in the keynote, taking you through all the um, exciting new stuff in the latest Grails release. We have got a sort of full REST support. There's async stuff in there. There's more data stuff, et cetera. Um, so another, sort of, another big year for Grails, and I'm excited to actually drop into some of the 2GX part of the conference this year and just catch up on what's been happening in that part of the world. So there's Grails. Um, here's something completely new, Spring XD. Um, Spring XD is a distributed and extensible runtime for building big data style applications. Um, it's based on, um, again, a really, really nice domain-specific language, a really succinct abstraction for specifying things like how am I going to ingest data, how am I going to do real-time processing of the data on the way in, how I do batch processing, how I do export, etc. cetera. Um, you're going to see a lot about Spring XD tomorrow night in the keynote. Um, so one of the things I'm really, really kind of, so many things I'm excited about this year, but one of the things I'm really excited about this year is Spring XD. Um, it reminds me of the very early days of Spring when we were looking at the traditional way people were building applications in the enterprise Java space and thinking there just has to be a better way. And there was a better way and that became Spring. And you know, Spring in the early days said, look, there's lots of good things about the enterprise Java platform, but the EJB model is not one of them. Um, we can do things a better way. 
when I look at what's happening in the, in the big data world of Hadoop, I say, oh, there's a lot of good things about what's happening in that, but some of the way that you build those big data applications and the program model and the churn there, that's not one of them. We could do things in a better way. Um, and I'm really excited about what the XD team are doing in this space. Now, last but no means least, um, another completely new component we're introducing this week, um, Spring Boot. Spring Boot, um, we always talk about productivity. I've been on the stage at Spring One every year for many years saying productivity is important. This is like, you just have to see this. In fact, you will see this really, really soon. Um, our friends at Pivotal Lab moving collaborating said that uh, Spring Boot really puts a developer enjoyment back into building applications, and I like that phrase a lot. Um, it will help you very, very rapidly with minimal code, with zero configuration, with no XML, put together a very, very um, cohesive Spring application. It's built with kind of DevOps scenarios in mind. So with, with boot, you can create a self-contained executable really easily. You don't have to deploy it to an external container. You can if you want to. You don't have to. Um, and it's got some pre-integrated kind of operations-ready features. And again, you're going to see a whole lot more about that in just a moment. Um, so this whole collection is at the Spring I.O. platform. There's a foundation layer, a cohesive set of version modules across the project to help you kind of get a grip on what's going on, give you a basis for targeting. On top of that, there's the I.O. execution layer um, where we have these domain-specific runtimes and so some really exciting new innovation. And um, we've now been going for far too long in a, a Spring One conference without getting close to some code so you're going to be pleased to know I'm now going to hand over to Dave Sire, first of all, who's going to come up and take you through Spring Boot, show you what it's like to build an application with Boot. He'll be followed by Jürgen Hurler, giving you some edited highlights of the Spring Framework 4.0 release. And then Chris Beams is going to come on the stage and take you through what we've been doing with the new Spring website um, and a few other goodies that I won't reveal yet. So Dave Sire, over to you. Thanks, Adrian, and um, hello, everyone. So, yeah, it's going to be about code. I'm going to do a demo. Um, um, but I guess I'll just spend a couple of slides telling you, you know, what it is and why we're doing it, because um, it's, it's, it's sometimes with Spring, it, there's a lot of magic, right? Things happen, and you don't always know where they came from. Um, if, you've have that, if you've had that experience, and if you have that experience tonight with my demo, Come and see us talk about it tomorrow morning. Phil and I are doing a, a long hour and a half session on it, and you can see actually what is happening. It's nothing scary, OK? Um, it's just what you always do with Spring. But um, the thing is, like Adrian was just explaining, um, it is an explosion. There are so many different ways of um, consuming Spring these days, so many different modules, projects, jar files. You know, They're everywhere, and they're, they're, they're Spring this, Spring that, Spring everything. Um, how do you get your arms around that? How, how do you um, find a focal point? And that's what we want this to be. We want Spring Boot to be the first place you go if you're building an app. And, or if you're building, in particular, something domain-specific, like Adrian was saying. And I'll, I think the demo that I show, if you don't quite see what's happening, if it's a little bit too magic, that might be good, because actually what I've done is I've just created a new domain. right? And you didn't need to know the details. It was abstracted. So it's, all, it's about opinions, basically. It's, it's, it's refreshing. It's, it's actually uh, really exciting. And you know, I'm, I've been cast as Mr. Grumpy now, but um, I, <laughs> I suppose what you could, what you could say is um, if they put a Brit on the stage to, to introduce this stuff, and I'm using words like exciting <laughs> and momentous, and this will change your life, right? It's already changed my life. So if I can say that, then just think what you know, somebody from this side of the pond would have said. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to be really good. So um, it, it, let me, I can paraphrase that by saying, um, well, I guess telling you uh, the history of opinions right, in, in the Java space. It, I guess I was looking at some code that um, Rod or Jürgen or somebody wrote, like the Spring 1.0 when I was working on Spring Boot. And I was looking at it thinking, wow. This is really radical. These guys are cutting really interesting new ground, right? They're really, really thinking about it, and they're making things up as they go along. <laughs> what a luxury. 
Um, <laughs> and you know, we 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 haven't always been able to do that for the last you know ten years or so, six years or so, because we've just been so busy covering so much ground, right? There's so there's such a broad um, sweep of things that you have to do to, to to be able to answer everybody's questions. It's really hard um, to have an opinion, and, and Java developers, enterprise Java developers in particular, seem to be kind of allergic to having opinions, and why is that? I have no idea, I really don't. Um, and so now it, it's a real luxury, that we can sit down and we can invent new things and say, this is my opinion, this is the way you should do it, this is the way I do it, so I think it's great. Come and have a look, if you don't like it, then that's fine. So here are some um, nuggets, right, some, bo some boot bullets. Get started faster, right? I'll show you, show you how to do that in a minute. Be opinionated out of the box. So we have opinions that we're sharing with you for a change. Right? We didn't used to do that very much. In fact, I think I could probably quote myself on a Spring forum or a mailing list somewhere saying, Spring tries quite hard not to be opinionated. And it's true. In the past, it was true. Um, here's the key thing. So with Spring Boot, we really try to get out of the way as quickly as possible. If you have an opinion that's different than mine, then that's fine. You can have that. And I'll, I'll just let you get on with it. Um, and that's important, and hopefully you'll see that in more detail tomorrow morning with me and Phil. Um, a third really important feature set is, um, well, I mean, you know, um, there are lots of inspiration for it, but one of the things that's inspired me is um, I worked on the Cloud Foundry project for a couple of years, and, you know, it runs 24-7. <laughs> I was on pager duty. That was an interesting experience, right? I mean, you, have, you form opinions quite quickly if you're on pager duty, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm sure you know. Um, so there are certain things you know, that we had to do to, to keep an app running or to understand what was going on with it when it wasn't running more often, um, which are in the category of sort of common non-functional features, things that you always do. You always write this code. Every time you write an app, you always do this. It's boilerplate. Where have you heard that before? Well, isn't, isn't that what Spring's supposed to get rid of? Ah, yes, right. So this is Spring Boot. We're getting rid of some new pieces of boilerplate and providing, in this case, non-functional features. I'll show you an example in a minute. And last but not least, and this is also kind of ironic, me standing here and saying no XML. Um, because I've been you know, one of the biggest supporters of XML configuration that there has been. But I haven't used it for six months or so, and I'm kind of not missing it. <laughs> 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 Strange to say. Um, now, there's one last bastion of XML configuration, which was, well, two actually. One was Spring Batch, because the, the um, you know, I still think actually that XML is a good structure for a state machine, and so if you're writing jobs and steps, I think we persuaded the JSR guys that that was actually the case, right? I mean, we had that conversation with them. Um, but then I wrote the Java config support for Spring Batch, and I thought, hmm, actually, yeah, this is all right. I quite like this. So, <laughs> so I know, anyway, so, um, you know, an old dog can learn some new tricks. And to prove it, I'm going to um, show you what we've been working on a bit more concretely, and hopefully as quickly as possible. And it can be very quick because of the way we've designed it. So um, start on a terminal. OK, you, if you read the blog, then you've actually probably seen this, but it is actually such a sweet little demo that I'm going to, um, going to show you it again, even if you have seen it before. If you haven't, you'll be really impressed. So here's um, a text editor, right? I mean, strange to start a Spring demo with, with Emacs, but there you go. I'm going to write some Groovy, right? App controller. Ah, doesn't that, that's Spring, isn't it? Yeah, that, I, I've seen that somewhere before. Class, application. OK, I'm writing an application, so that makes sense, doesn't it? Um, what I want to do is I want to have a home page request capital R, request mapping the root home page thing. Um, what shall I make it? It's groovy. I can do anything, right? Def home. Um, and then I can just return a map with a message in it. That's my sort of canonical. It's slightly different than the, than the example in the, in the blog, just to make it a little bit interesting. OK, that looks like a Spring application, doesn't it? Actually, I'm going to make one small change to this. New annotation in Spring for 
If you don't want to put at request body on all of your methods, you can just do rest controller. That's nice. So this is already aimed at the sort of JSON consumption uh, restful world. Okay, so that, that, that is an application that runs. Shall I prove it? Um, spring, spring, um, which spring? Just I'm gonna check that I'm gonna do this <laughs> really carefully. Yeah, that looks fine. Spring run at dog Ruby. There it goes, right. It did a little bit of thinking, trying to work out where, it's all, de where all its dependencies were. Um, and then it found them, and then it started logging, and actually when it started, the application started really quickly. That was spring starting up, right? Now it's pausing, it's waiting for me to, um, to say hello to it, or for it's waiting to say hello to me, I suppose I should say. So I'll just open it up in a browser. There you go, there's my JSON. I think that's really sweet. I, I'm really proud of that, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, I, again, going back to my experience with Cloud Foundry, I spent a lot of time looking at and writing Ruby code. And you can do that so easily in Ruby, Python, you know, it, scripting languages, basically. Why can't you do it in Spring, I thought. So that's what, that's what I did. <laughs> and, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you appreciated it. I think it's really, really interesting. And it's, it will be the start of other things, I'm sure. Um, come and see tomorrow. I won't try and explain how that works now. Come and see Phil and my talk tomorrow, and we'll do it properly. Now, I'm going to do the same thing in Java, right? Because not everybody wants to write Groovy. Um, we actually do have an app in production that supports um, the Spring Boot development process written in that style. I can show you that tomorrow as well. Um, we've also got one in production uh, using the Java style, and so I'm going to show you that very quickly as well. I'm going to give, make a demo. Um, I'm going to start with Spring Boot uh, Starter Parent. Okay, so st remember the word starter because I'm starting a project, right? <clears throat> so that's a useful thing to be able to do really quickly. Um, this step, by the way, all this stuff is going to be one click rather than a several just when STS catches up with me. Um, but at the meantime, in the meantime, I'm going to add a dependency to Spring Boot. Oops, when I spell it right. This stuff. There we go, Spring Back. What should we do? Should we do, actually, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump straight to the chase. Do you remember um, Adrian was just talking about Stomp? Well, he was talking about web sockets and messaging abstractions. Actually, what he was talking about was Stomp. Um, so what I've got here is um, a Stomp web socket auto configure plugin for Spring Boot. One of the FAQs on Spring Boot is how do I extend it? Because it does all this cool stuff. How, what if I want to do more cool stuff? And this is an answer to that question. And I will show you um, how it actually works tomorrow morning if you come to the session with Phil. Okay, so I'm going to, to make this work, I need a, a specific set of Java, Spring, and Tomcat. And I need some uh, snapshot repositories to support that. And I also need a plugin to build it. I don't need this plugin, but I'm, I'm going to find it useful. And you will find out why tomorrow if you come to the talk. OK, that all should work. Um, Maven will now main because I changed the Java version. OK, um, that, believe it or not, is actually almost a runnable application. I do have to do one thing because of Java language um, uh, restrictions. I tried quite hard to get out of this, but unfortunately, it seems to be the case that at static methods, right, you can't inherit them. So there's no way to kind of have a way to do this without writing a few lines of code. Um, so what I have to do is at enable auto configuration. That's one of the Spring Boot features that basically gets you really started really quickly. And that was implicit in the Groovy one that I showed you already. I'm going to make this a controller, not a REST controller, because I'm going to add a UI to it in a minute. And I'm going to add a main method, string application uh, run application.class. And this, incidentally, is a personal itch that I've 
been wanting to scratch for some time. I always thought that Spring should support creating main applications, main methods much more easily. And how much more easily could it be than that? OK, now this is actually runnable. I'll prove it, I think. <laughs> I hope. Fingers crossed. All I did there was um, run as Java application, by the way. Super simple. And it's running, all right? Um, what's it doing? Well, it's got a bunch of endpoints there already. One of them is metrics. You remember I said something about non-functional requirements? So I'm just collecting metrics about um, 200 responses on the metrics endpoint, two, right? Those, that, that's, I'm counting them, so every time I load this page, you get a, an in increment. So I thought, when I, when I um, was thinking about what to do for a demo for this, I thought, well, that's nice, it's quite impressive, but what if we could um, feed that information real time into a browser and have everybody in the room load it on their phone? Okay, so everybody get their phone ready, and we'll do that. And how are we going to do that? We're we going to build a jar file. Maven package. Whoops. What does it say? There is no form A, idiot. <laughs> okay. And then I'm going to um, check RVM use one line three. I'm going to use Cloud Foundry so that we can just see it quickly. JS more minus minus target. Um, no, minus minus power. Target the jar file. Okay, so there's a jar file there. There's also a dot jar dot original. So we've modified the jar and added um, a, a main class basically, so we can launch our stuff. Um, and that's, fingers crossed. So while that's, I'll just wait till I see that working, and then I'll go back and show you some more features. You always have to keep your fingers crossed at a conference if you're using the network, right? Yeah, that looks like it's probably going to work. So um, back in the browser, um, there are some other endpoints I could show you. Um, so we could do trace. These are HTTP requests. We just store, this is configurable, but we store the last 100 requests so that you can just see what's been happening in the app. Um, headers and uh, request and response headers that we found that really useful <laughs> running an app and kind of if it seems like it's just fallen over you want to see what somebody was doing in it really quickly you can do it that way if it looks like it's hung and doesn't want to interact with the world you can get a thread dump nice yeah if you wonder how the spring application set up you can get your bean definitions and have a look at those if you what's another one that's another good one um, uh, well, there's an empty one called info. I'll think of I'll think of other things to show you tomorrow because we're probably yeah we're probably available now. So if you all don't use HTTP, use HTTPS. HTTPS um, monitor. Cfapps. Io. And if you can type better than me, um, then slash monitor. I was actually going to make it the home page, but I didn't, so you have to actually add slash monitor at the end as well. See, you're already doing it, <laughs> because I'm seeing loads of requests coming in. All of the, everybody who just loaded that page um, pushed a message to everybody else in the room who's loading that page, and um, they're updating the counters. This is visually, visually um, it works, right? So thank you, everybody, all you... Um, However many people, how many people do we think just loaded that page? <laughs> a couple of hundred. Okay, um, so that was basically the demo. I'll go back over here and show, some, show one more slide. And then I'll hand you over to you. Again. So that's a, a kind of... Um, a uh, very quick start guide to a few features in, in, in Boots and where those features actually live and how we package them and, and modularize them is what this slide is, slide, slide is about. So it's sort of onion skins. Um, we, we, we found, we think, quite a good way to break things down. We have, we have a number of goals which are not 
Um, they're not a single thing on their own. They're actually several different goals, and we can separate them into um, modules that make sense to us. And we think we'll probably, um, some of them will live longer than others. Some of them will actually get folded back into Spring, perhaps, or into the other Spring projects. And Spring Boot, in the end, might just be a very, very small amount of code that, you know, and maybe, you know, documentation to, to get people set up as quickly as possible. Um, so if you want to know more about all of these features and why we package them that way, come to Phil and my um, Zero Effort Spring talk tomorrow morning. So with that, I think I'll hand over to uh, Jürgen. He can tell you about Spring 4 very quickly. And then it's Chris's turn. Thank you. So, hello, first of all. Um, welcome to the uh, Spring Framework 4 section here. Um, for the sake of timing, I'm going to keep this brief. Um, you've already noticed that we have a related session bar at the bottom of some of those slides. You'll see quite a few of those in my section here. Um, with Spring Framework 4 maybe the most interesting uh, observation at this conference is that you're primarily learning about it implicitly in other sessions, in uh, the Spring Boot sessions, in that there are quite a few Spring from 4.0 features sneaking through um, the surface in other sessions. Uh, and of course, there's some dedicated content like my Spring on Java 8 session tomorrow. Nevertheless, Spring from 4.0 is very much a, an effort in um, basically two, two directions, for two purposes. Um, we are raising the bar, we're creating a new baseline. So Spring from 4.0 for us represents an opportunity to basically say, all right, it's all Java 6 plus now. We, are, uh, we look at all of our third party dependencies for other open source projects. We raise the bar to like 2010 and onwards. No older version supported anymore. We are cutting our own deprecated packages, removing deprecated methods on our and so raising the baseline is an important effort in its own right. We are doing this every couple of years in order to create an opportunity for us and the entire ecosystem to basically rebase on a more recent foundation and to cut off some, uh, some older fat. On the other hand, Spring for McFarrell very much is a supporting effort for many of the other initiatives that we have here most importantly Spring Boot at this very point, um, but um, just uh, a few months out in, the, in later this year, you're going to see further Spring 4 based releases, Grades 3.0 for example, and others. So, of course, what we always do with a new Spring framework generation, in particular the major generations, is revisiting the core container. And I've just picked a few favorites of mine here, at this point in the evolution of the core container model in Spring, most of the innovation that we do is rather subtle. So we are basically taking our annotation-based component model and we're fine-tuning it in many ways. And some of the things um, mentioned here, like the uh, model for conditional bean definitions, isn't brand new. We've had ways to do kind of conditional bean definitions before, but now there's a first class model with literally a conditional annotation and the condition type. This is what Spring Boot is heavily based on, uh, as you may imagine. And it, it, it's, of course, uh, the good old bean definition profiles dating back to Spring 3.1. Those basically were a kind of limited, more static kind of condition and are being re-implemented as a profile condition in the new model now. Our composable annotation model is one of my favorites. And um, we are revis revisiting that part as well because composing annotations was always a bit of an exercise in, in making up your mind on one definitive set of uh, characteristics. You basically baked everything into one annotation. What if you wanted to have some attributes in there? What if you wanted to be able to override a few things here or there? to define your own annotations with a few options to customize those through annotation attributes. There's a new model now that we're using, a new convention for building those kinds of custom annotations, overriding specific attributes in 
spring annotations that you use as meta annotations to define your own. And uh, in the last box here, uh, the injection support, of course, one of the cornerstones of the co-contain anyway, um, is being fine-tuned in quite a few ways as well here. Uh, we have a well-defined model for ordered injection of lists and arrays now. We have support for an add lazy annotation at the injection point, um, where you get a lazy resolving proxy, lazy resolution proxy injected if you're asking for it, driven by the injection point. And we're revisiting our support for generics, where up until this point, we support specific kinds of generics only at the injection point for type matching purposes, for type resolution purposes, uh, candidate resolution purposes. And we're revisiting this now to be a, uh, well, a little bit more open to your own custom use of generics um, and to resolve against uh, generics that we can find in the target candidate means. Another exercise that we always go through with a major spring generation is we revisit our support for Java specifications. Spring Framework 3.0 was our opportunity back then in 2009 to rebase ourselves on Java E6, to basically say Java E6 is our mainstream generation of uh, target specifications such as JPA, Bean validation and so forth now. There are many of those that we still very much closely integrate with. JPA, of course, now 2.1, Bean Validation 1.1. There's even a new JTA specification, like it's hiding down there, but it's actually quite nice because there's a standard transactional annotation in there that we support out of the box now next to our own. So many of those specifications um, come from the E7 umbrella but to us, what they are important for is not E7, it's actually the individual specification set that really matter here. Uh, JPA, mean validation, uh, JTA, JMS 2.0, the first JMS, uh, the first new JMS release since like April 2002. That's when JMS 1.1 came out. I and mean, can you believe that? More than 10 years without a new JMS spec. But now we have JMS 2.0 and now we support it out of the box in, in Spring Framework 4. A few other noteworthy ones are up there. If you'd like to hear more about those, um, I'm going to cover them in my Spring on Java 8 session tomorrow because uh, Java 8 itself, of course, is the most important, maybe, um, well, specification, a set of specifications that we support, GSR 3.10 being one important part of it. Um, those, those uh, language features that we can find in Java 8 are a really, really nice fit. So hint, hint, uh, there's the spring on Java 8 session down in the related session bar. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to show you some nice examples. Um, and we're going to not only um, look at Java 8, the language features, we're going to see how they fit with the spring programming model. All right, in the web support, we always do improvements here or there, of course. I'm just uh, dropping a few here. You've seen REST controller, like a, a web controller that implies response body. It's kind of uh, pre-configured or pre-opinionated for RESTful conventions. And we have an async REST template now. The name says it all. It's an async version of REST template. Um, returning fugues, listen to fugues, uh, instead of uh, uh, the straight result and being implemented with asynchronous HTTP processing in the background. We um, are taking the core of the Spring Hate US project and move the core support for links and link building to Spring MVC for hypermedia links. And of course, we do lots of stuff in the WebSockets area. And just a, a few teasers here, because we're just going to be in-depth coverage of WebSockets in two sessions. Tomorrow, I think. Um, so we we are basically doing a really comprehensive cut uh, of web support here. Spring Framework 4.0 doesn't just deliver an initial cut here. It's uh, the, the milestones basically track our efforts towards probably the most comprehensive web support you'll find in uh, the Java. Uh, 
uh, framework space at the moment. If you choose to work at the WebSocket level, here's just an indication of what this feels like. You, you may dive into the management of WebSocket sessions, the processing of WebSocket messages, which basically is the level that WebSockets are defined on, right? It's, that's basically just uh, barely above TCP. Um, you have a kind of channel, a kind of uh, a session model, and uh, a, a stream of messages which is barely more than a byte stream with a few um, separation markers in between. Right? That's the WebSocket level. It's a foundational level. You're probably going to build your own kinds of little special purpose frameworks on top of that. Your own message formats, your own message protocols. That's the core WebSocket level and we do lots of stuff at that level. JSR 356 based, if you're interested in that, because the JSR 356 WebSocket specification is also going to be supported by Tomcat, of course. So um, you're going to have it around if you're using server containers, uh, the next generation of server containers. Um, and there's our own programming model here, translating to different kinds of runtimes underneath, if you want them to. That's the WebSocket level, but more specifically, we're actually doing extra stuff. We have SOC.js support. Um, so instead of just saying, I expect WebSockets to be present and to work with all of my infrastructure, we're doing fallback options. With SOC.js allows you to configure your application to basically operate at a WebSocket-like message processing model with that kind of model, with a kind of style. Um, at the same time, have built-in options to just adapt to the, um, to the infrastructure that's available at runtime. If your clients support WebSockets, that's great. If they don't, then there's like uh, um, SOCGS-based fallback processing available out of the box, still at the WebSocket level. Even more interestingly, we're going beyond WebSocket. We're building on top of WebSockets. We're doing full message style processing. We have great stomp support. Um, we have support for integrating with message brokers at a different level now with our own new messaging module being extracted from Spring integration where you basically define message endpoints. You define your message style interaction. WebSocket may be one of your uh, runtime translations down uh, in the infrastructure. But fundamentally, uh, it's about message style architectures, message style endpoint architectures in your system, in your application. So we're, we're taking that quite far. And if you dive into what we're providing here in Spring Framework for OEM3 at the moment, you'll find that there's lots of stuff, both in WebSockets and in the new messaging module. So if you're into this, definitely check out uh, the current state of things in 4.0 M3. All right, uh, there are two WebSocket sessions um, as, been, uh, as, as mentioned down in the related session bar, uh, introducing WebSocket sessions and the building WebSocket browser applications with Spring Session, doing in-depth coverage of this entire domain, uh, of everything that I've, I've been referring to here. All right, so much um, for the uh, Spring Framework 4.0, just a uh, pick of uh, favorite features here. You'll hear more about it at the conference in different sessions um, in the Spring on Java 8 session tomorrow, in the model component design, and in the WebSocket sessions and others, of course, also in the Spring Boot uh, sessions, since Spring Boot is so heavily Spring 4 based. But now, let me hand over to Chris Beams. Chris. Thanks, welcome again, everyone. You've heard uh, Adrian talking earlier about Spring I.O. You've heard Dave talking about Spring Boot. Jürgen talking about Spring Framework 4. I want to show you something now I'm really excited about that uh, in many ways brings them all together. A different face of what we call Spring I.O. And it's a new website. Right. Spring.io. 
And I want to show you what this is all about tonight and maybe have a little bit of fun along the way. Uh, so let's take a look, right? You'll be the first to see this tonight if we go over here and we say spring.io, which maybe a couple of you have already done. Hmm, <laughs> is that a big failure? <laughs> Right? An auth challenge. You probably shouldn't have to have credentials to get into the Spring website, right? Well, we didn't want anyone stumbling upon this before tonight. So we thought we'd actually flip the switch, if you will. Because, and actually have the site go live tonight. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do this is because, well, we built it from the ground up, right? We built it with Spring. We built it on top of Cloud Foundry for a number of reasons. Uh, one is, well, it just stands to reason if we're asking you to use this stuff, we probably ought to use it ourselves, like you do, right? 10 years on, it's easy to get uh, framework developer-itis, <laughs> right? You can spend a lot of time thinking about how to make things more productive without actually building anything yourself, right? Like a real application in the world. So we think that's incredibly important. That's number one. And number two is when we're putting something like Spring Boot out there, We'd really better test it out, right? Really better harden that model. So that's what we've been doing, working really hard for about the last six months on what you're about to see. So what do we do? Well, I'm not going to make you authenticate into the site. Let's actually flip the switch. And to do that, I want to show you a little bit about Cloud Foundry. How many, were, how many attended the platform conference? I know we've got some carryover. Yeah, a bunch of hands go up, right? So, you guys will know this. For some of you, this might be a little bit new. We're not going to talk a lot about Cloud Foundry, but it's important because this app is up and running on cf.com right now, cloudfoundry.com. Run.pivotal.io is where it lives today, right? And we're inside that console, and what you can see is we're in the production space of the spring.io organization. And there's a few apps running in there, but the ones that we care about that I'll talk to you about really quickly are Sagan Blue and Sagan Green. Sagan is the name of the app, right? And if you know anything about continuous deployments or zero downtime deployments or rolling deployments, right? These go by different names. Blue-green deployments is a technique, right? It's a technique for never having the cycle down. So I have two copies of the app up, and that's exactly what we have here. And the copy that you're looking at right now is Sagan Blue. Right? And Sagan Blue has basic auth turned on. That's why we got the challenge. So what we want to do, our goal here, and this is the fun part probably, <laughs> is to get switched over to Sagan Green because basic auth is turned off. So we want to get spring.io, that domain, mapped over. So let's just take a quick look at what's in Sagan Blue. I just said that that's the live site or the active site, right? It's up, it's running, thank goodness. Four instances, right? And there you see the domain spring.io is mapped onto that app. So that's why we're routing there. And you heard Dave talking earlier about management endpoints in boot, right? So one of the management endpoints that he was starting to show you is info. Turns out to be a really useful one, right? This is all built on top of Spring Boot. So what do we see there? Things like, well, which app is running? In fact, not just which app, but which instance of that app did we just hit? So if we refresh, right, you can start to see there's Cloud Foundry load balancing as we cross those four instances. But what you don't see is that we're, we're never hitting Sagan Green. We're only hitting Sagan Blue because that's where the route goes. That's where Spring.io is mapped. So here's the trick. We're going to now map Spring.io onto both of those sides, onto both of those apps, so that it load balances between them, and then we'll unbind from Sagan Blue, and then you can all get into the new site. That's the game, right? Unfortunately, we have the CF console, the Cloud Foundry console, and we have a little script here called launch, <laughs> right? So if you've been around the Cloud Foundry console, you probably know this well. It's also pretty easy to read, right? CF map onto the Sagan Green app, Spring.io, we have to do a couple of domains here, but just focus on the second one. CF map on a Sagan Green, Spring.io. At that point, Spring.io is pointing to both sides, and then unmap from Sagan Blue, the URL, Spring.io. And at that point, we're switched over. So let's just try it one more time, make sure. Spring.io gives us an auth challenge. 
Right. So launch. Fingers crossed, right? <laughs> So binding Sagan production.cfapps.io, this is one of the underlying URLs. Seems to have worked. Binding spring.io to Sagan Green and unmapping it from Sagan Blue. And if we try that again, voila. Yeah. So that's one little tiny piece of what we mean when we say let's build a better enterprise, right? I know a lot of you are already out there well aware of a technique like that. But probably there are others that aren't, right? So we wanted to, you know, exercise our muscles in that, in that world a little bit, really build a Spring app on top of CF. And of course, right, that's all fun and interesting. That's how we built it, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And I'll talk a lot more about it on Wednesday morning when we have a session on this. And of course, the first and most important function of this site is for all of you as Spring developers, practitioners, right? whether experts or newcomers. It's actually built with everybody in mind. So the first uh, question, let me just take you on a quick tour. First question that anybody who really kind of knows Spring, right? when you come to the site, you just want to say, where are the docs, man? I just need to get a question answered. So the very first thing we give you is a quick reference to documentation. Right? So maybe you wanted to find out something about boot right? or something about the new Spring Framework 4.0 version, right? So all the versions, and important, right? All of the supported versions, all of the current versions, all of the versions that we're recommending that you use. So you know there's a whole bunch of Spring Framework versions out there, right? These are the ones that are live, supported, thought about by the team, right? Whether snapshots, release candidates, milestones, or GA, you know? And a, and a little map to guide you. 3.2.4 is the current GA release of the Spring Framework, and you can jump to the reference or API doc. Right? So quick and easy documentation reference, but the guides are something completely new. And this is something that people have asked for for a long time. You see lots of people out there in the world, blogs and so on, putting together guides around Spring. But we really wanted to uh, give you guys the best that we could possibly do in answering the question, not how do I do X with Spring, Right? Spring actually isn't the point. The point is, what are you building? What are you doing? What do you want to get done? You've probably, in the past week or so, typed something into Google, right? The last time you started to build something. You typed something into Google like building a RESTful web service in Java or on the JVM or what have you. And you want to see what's out there. What are the competing frameworks? What are the competing techniques and so on for how to build RESTful web services? So, you know, that's what you see right here. And these are designed, we call these getting started guides. And these are designed to be completed in 15 to 30 minutes, typically. The requirements are typically not more than a JDK and a text editor. They're designed to be able to go from 0 to 60, just copying and pasting your way to working code, getting to the hello world of any given development task, and of course, using Spring to do it. Using maybe just one part of Spring, maybe using several modules from Spring. Again, it's not about the projects, it's about the task. So we hope you'll find that really useful. Of course, some of you will be experts and you don't need this level. Maybe that's for your coworker, right? Or some of you are experts, but you've never touched or looked at this piece or part of Spring, or you've never solved this particular problem before, right? So the Getting Started Guides, in that way, you're a newcomer, right? So the Getting Started Guides can be for you too. Okay, so explore those. We hope you find those very useful. These are all uh, open source and available, right? They're all, each one has its own. GitHub repo, each one has GitHub issues open for it. So if you're going through, you find an issue, you want to improve it, of course, just log an issue. If you don't see a guide, uh, if, if there's a guide that you'd love to see, but you don't see it, right? you can talk to us on Twitter about that. Just click there, talk to Spring Central about guides. right? So we really hope to build that out. We've been working for uh, really months on this, a, a team of people, you know, people who you know, some of you will know their names, like Craig Walls and Greg Turnquist and Roy Clarkson have been just heads down working on this stuff uh, day and night. So we've got about 50 of these uh, already, and you know, we, we hope to grow that and keep those up to date over time. And one last key thing about the guides is that Kind of like Spring Boot, Dave was talking about it's good to be opinionated sometimes, right? These are always using the latest and greatest of, that Spring has to offer. So not a thousand options, right? Really, this is the best way to do it. This is the way that we recommend, and so on. 
And then uh, finally on guides, before we move on, there's tutorials. So where the getting started guides are just that, getting started, hello world, right? The tutorials are a deeper dive, designed to be two to three hours, right? Think about a week of uh, lunch times or something like that. To really dive in, do something real, and turn around able to build a real world app, or at least begin that process. All right, and so of course these take quite a bit more investment, and we look forward to building out more of those as well. Those are also open source, they also have their own repositories. So that's the guides. Uh, the projects, of course you know the Spring projects well, uh, but you, you might not be able to sort of keep them all in your head, right? And here finally is one place where you can see all of the projects, right, at a high level, right? Spring Data has multiple sub-projects underneath it. Spring Social has multiple sub-projects underneath it, but here's just one place to jump off to each one. And for example, if we're jumping off to, you know, let's say Spring AMQP, right? So each page has their own. Don't forget to go to the demo lounge, apparently. <laughs> right? So each one has, uh, you know, when, you're actually, when you actually know that you want to use a piece of Spring, isn't the first question just how do I get it on my class path, right? How do I get up and running with it as quickly as possible? So that's why we're always giving you that same menu, right, of supported versions, change the version, that changes the Maven metadata or the Gradle, uh, you know, dependency uh, instructions, right? Just copy and paste, put it in your build, you're good to go. Jump off to the different resources from there. So we hope you'll find that very useful. Our blog, right? been around Spring for a while, you've probably seen the Spring Source blog. So that's been completely re-implemented in Spring. And, uh, and we've ported over all the old blog posts, right? So you can follow now actually categorized Atom feeds there. So follow engineering, follow it all, follow just releases, etc. cetera. And uh, of course you can get to know the team, <laughs> right? After all this time, we're actually, I, th I think it kind of surprised us all when we saw this map, just how just how many of us there are and how distributed we are around the world. And uh, so that's a little something as well. Um, okay, so with all of that in mind, um, again, Wednesday morning, uh, we'll have a session on this, Spring I.O. inside and out, spring.io inside and out. And um, I, I just want to say a couple of thank yous really quick. You know, one, like, it's really been a, a huge effort from, from the team building this. Um, so a big thank you to our internal team, right, our design people, right, the people that are building the docs and so on. But one of the most uh, special interactions that we had, uh, that we started right from the get-go, you heard Paul talking about uh, Pivotal, you know, why are these pieces coming together inside of Pivotal? Why is Spring part of Pivotal? Why is Cloud Foundry part of Pivotal? Why is Pivotal Labs a part of Pivotal? And I don't know if you know much about Pivotal Labs, but uh, they're a consultancy, right? And they're basically out there building Rails apps all day long for years and years. And now that we're all part of one company, we thought it would be really interesting to collaborate, right? That's what they do with people every day. Let's build in interesting user interactions. Let's build, you know, somewhat sophisticated website. So we paired up with Pivotal Labs. And for the last months, we've had you know, a team in London, we've had a team in Santa Monica. Uh, some of them are here right now, so David, you can raise your hand, right? Edward Hyatt is uh, running the show at Pivotal. So thank you guys very, very much. I'd actually like to bring Edward up, if you don't mind, for a moment, and have him say a little bit on behalf of uh, the teams that have been working on this, uh, basically Rails and front-end folks that we're building a spring app for the last six months, right? So. Yeah, thank you. We on here? Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Chris. Um, first of all, I'd like to just thank you, Chris, for the chance uh, to build this website. Obviously, this is an integral part of this community, and I hope you all enjoy it and find it useful and love it and tell us what you think of it over the, over the coming months and years. It was really a pleasure to work with you guys and to kind of warm up to a community that we have been a part of over the years, actually. Um, I don't know how much of you, uh, how much you all know about the history of Pivotal Labs. We've been around for about 25 years, actually. And we're known these days for building uh, consumer-facing Rails apps, mobile apps, certainly. But we actually have been involved with Java Enterprise development you know, for many years, and in particular, Spring is its inception. Um, but this was a chance, uh, this project, for us to reacquaint ourselves a bit with the Java and the Spring community. So we kind of jumped on it. 
um, as Chris says, being part of the Pivotal company now, uh, our energies are, are more and more focused on enterprise clients and uh, as a result, uh, Enterprise Java and of course Spring. So this was a chance for us to get to know Spring again, kind of re-enter having been um, le less engaged for maybe you know, five, six years. And as Chris said, we've been mainly working in extremely modern technologies, Ruby on Rails primarily. Um, uh, just, just before I get, get, to, get back to the project, um, it was said earlier that uh, enterprise developers sometimes suffer from a lack of opinions, which I'll take some issue with, Adrian, perhaps. Um, but uh, at Pivotal Labs, you know, we're, we're known for being very opinionated. Um, you know, we're, we're in the business of building applications for many clients a year, very fast, very high quality, um, and in the process, teaching those clients how it is that we uh, build the applications in that way. And uh, probably you know that we're deeply enmeshed in the, in the Agile community. We've been there since the beginning of the Agile uh, sort of uh, ethos and culture developed. And throughout all the years we've been doing Agile development, I think the one thing that's remained constant isn't technology. It's, it's the way we think about technology choices and process choices. How is it that you build great applications? How is it that you choose great technologies? And what underlies that mentality at Pivotal Labs is that you're always focused. We teach everyone to be always as focused as they can be on productivity. What is it that's going to serve the business needs the best, the fastest, and the most efficient way? Right? And you know, it's, it's no secret that there have been charges leveled at some Java frameworks, and I'd, I'd include Spring in this over the years, that there's been not enough focus on that, not enough focus on developer happiness, so to speak. You know, too much boilerplate code is a constant refrain. So to get back to the project, you know, having had this kind of deviation and, 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 and this experience with Ruby on Rails especially, you know, the bar at Pivotal Labs has been set very high for developer happiness in a, in a framework, in a language. And there's really a very low tolerance for boilerplate code, you know, XML configuration, hell, et cetera. Right? Um, so it was with great interest that we approached this project. You know, what, what has developed in the last four or five years in the Spring community, we, we wanted to find out. And I was very interested to take the pulse of the team in London who was working in, in, the, in the more modern Spring technologies. And by that I mean many of the features that you've heard about already tonight in Spring Fall. So the, the team engaged with Chris's team in April. I've been working on this site since then. And I'm happy to, to see it launch tonight, although I tried to convince Chris not to do that just now, and he did it anyway. <laughs> not a best practice, I told him. Um, but but uh, we had a chance to play with some of the, the more recent stuff, in a particular Spring Boot. And you know, the team in London has had nothing but positive things to say. They are raving about the productivity in the most recent uh, Spring releases. They are comparing it completely favorably to productivity gains you get with Rails, but of course with the heavyweight backing of the Spring framework and technology underlying it that Rails doesn't have. So you know, this has been quite an eye-opening experience for us at Labs, and uh, many people in our company now are excited about Spring, uh, wanting to use it on every project, you know, as I say, favorably comparing it to Ruby on Rails and the technologies that have been developed outside of the Java community the last you know, half decade or so. So this is a huge development. You know, the, the productivity gains here are huge that we've found in the, in the most recent release of Spring. It's been a real pleasure to work on this project. And I hope you, you see that in the, in the website we've built for you. Um, thanks again, Chris, for giving us the chance. Thank you. I will just say one thing on, on behalf of, uh, of Labs. Um, you know, prior to my coming to Spring Source, I did work with Agile you know, development and so on, ran Scrum teams and so on. I've never seen people do Agile like this. This is really Agile done right. And I actually like the fact that they just call it the pivotal way. <laughs> it actually deserves a different name. I've been taught lesson after lesson after lesson about what prioritizing really means <laughs> with these guys, right? And it, and it got us over the finish line, so again, thank you. Um, okay, so before we break, before we all get our beverage of choice, I um, just want to say uh, that we're, again, really excited to see where we go with this, right? You know, just on the docket coming up are things like 
uh, you know, upgrading this whole application to you know, JDK 8 and you know, a number of things we couldn't do to just get to the finish line here. But what we really want to do with Spring.io is make it a premier reference application. Uh, and what I mean by that is you know, this is just one kind of application. You, know, you all build many different kinds of applications and websites, of course. Enterprise applications run the gamut. This is one kind of application called a you know, moderately high traffic web app. Right? It's not a web scale web app, but you know, millions of requests a month. That's interesting enough. Interesting enough that we thought you might also want to look at it. So in the coming weeks, we'll be open sourcing this, right? So that everybody can take a look, can dig in, can learn from what we've done, help improve what we've done, and we'll go forward with this as one of what we hope will become a series of reference applications to look to uh, for Spring. So with that, thank you so much, and talk to you soon.